On behalf of the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy's Board of Advisors, I thank you for attending the 2016 National Leadership Forum. I'm Ken Brecker, the president of the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, and as a member of the Board of Advisors, I have the great pleasure of introducing Monica Lozano. The subject of Monica's talk will be strategic leadership, foundation, governance in an era of partners. And I'm delighted to report that Monica's remarks will draw upon what she feels are the lessons that she's learned from her own experience in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors, and how those lessons influence how she feels foundations are governed. And I'm keen to know, that's an understatement, I am excited to know what she knows and to understand what she understands. And not only about our country today, but who we will be. And perhaps most important, I want to understand who she wants us to be in the future. Monica Lozano is appropriately regarded as a person of not only wide experience, but of integrity and courage. Her record of accomplishments could not be more impressive. In 1985, she joined La Opinion, the country's leading Spanish language daily newspaper. In 2004, she was named publisher and CEO. In 2010, she became CEO of its parent company, Impremedia. She led the transformation of that company into a multimedia content provider that today reaches over 20 million Latinos and through its various platforms is a leading provider of information, important information, I would actually say crucial information to the Hispanic community. Her current role is chairman of the board of the US Hispanic Media Inc., the parent company of Impremedia. In addition to her work in business, Monica chairs the Weingart Foundation Board. She's also the chair of the Latinos and Society Policy Program at the Aspen Institute. She serves on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation and is a longtime member of two corporate boards, Bank of America and the Walt Disney Company. And she is the current chair of the University of California's Board of Regents. And she knows something about truth. And she understands a truth about America. And where does that truth originate? I would like to think, in fact, I do think, that it is from her extraordinary family and the great advantage of being from a family, the advantage of being descended from immigrants who never lost their commitment to freedom of speech and access to information for everyone. Monica's parents were born in Arizona and Texas. Her grandfather was a well-known Mexican writer from northern Mexico who came to the United States during the revolution, had to come during the revolution because of what he was writing about Mexico, the truth he was telling about the government and the changes that were needed for all, the Mexi all Mexicans. He landed in Texas uh, and created a delivery system, a platform for Spanish-speaking Americans who deserved, he felt, who needed a press that was not constrained by censorship or by repression. He founded two newspapers in Texas, La Prensa, and then in Los Angeles, La Opinion. And he did this under three words. These three words were his direction, his guide, his goals. The first, daily, every day. The second, popular, popular, read by all, for everyone. And the third, independente, independent, the independent thinking of a community and of an individual. And there's a moment in Lin-Manuel Miranda's wonderful Broadway play, Hamilton, that captures that spirit of self-determination that gave birth to the American independence movement. Our founding fathers and mothers forged that identity, which is still ours during very tumultuous times. And by living tumultuous lives, and by necessity, our country was created exclusively by people who came from other places and by the descendants of those people. Alexander Hamilton himself was an immigrant from the island of St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. 
He was George Washington's aide-de-camp during the Revolution. He penned the Federalist Papers, and he helped conceive America's financial system. There is an unforgettable moment in the play when Hamilton and his comrade, his friend, the Marquis de Lafayette, realize that they're actually going to win the Revolutionary War. They're going to have their dream come true, an independent country. And they look at it, each other and they say something and the whole audience in the theater, I'd never seen anything like it, the whole audience goes to the edges of their seats and what they say to each other is, immigrants, we get the job done. It is my great pleasure to introduce a woman who daily and with great popularity and with true independence of mind and spirit gets the job done. Monica Lozano. What an introduction. That was just extraordinary. You know, part storyteller, theatrics, Hamilton, my grandfather. What a way to, what a way to start the evening. Um, and I know you've had just an extraordinary day, and I want to thank Ken for that introduction and Jim for um, putting this together, and thank you for having me here at this time of the day. I understand that you've had, you know, some really stimulating conversation and um, really provocative discussion from very early in this afternoon um, throughout the day, so thank you for being here. I actually wanted to take a step back and actually um, tell a little story, and, it, and it's funny because I, I forgot just how present USC was going to be in this particular panel. Um, but my story is actually completely tied to the University of Southern California. And it goes back to um, 25 years ago when I got one of those proverbial phone calls that literally changed the course of my life. And so it's 1991, the phone rings, and surprisingly and completely unexpectedly, it's the president of the University of Southern California on the other line inviting me to consider joining his board of trustees. And when you think about that, you know, university boards, there's um, about 6,000 universities in the country. Um, boards are typically between 20 to 50 people, depending on whether they're a public or a private. So I guess about 120,000 to 300,000 people get a phone call somewhat similar to this, but typically they're legacy, they have a relationship, they're donors, they're alumni, they've been on an advisory board. I was a 35-year-old Latina living in Los Angeles, editor of a Spanish language daily newspaper. Neither I nor anybody in my family had ever gone to USC, and I certainly wasn't in any position to contribute at the levels that USC might be expecting. But here they were calling me and asking me to join the board of that university. And when you think about both the vision of the president at the time, Dr. Stephen Sample, it was 1991. And if you think back to Los Angeles in those days, um, it was a fairly tumultuous time. We were in the throes of the economic recession. There was racial strife all across the Southland. There was a lack of belief and confidence in our institutions, and USC was right in the middle of what back then they called so disparagingly South Central Los Angeles. And USC had some choices to make. And the leader of that university, the president of the university, realized that it had some options. But to decide on the best option forward, it needed to have a board of counselors. It needed a group of trustees and advisors that could help both determine what was the right strategic direction and then move that institution forward. It could withdraw and relocate and abandon its urban mission like so many other universities. It could try to isolate itself maybe build a wall around the university and try to keep everybody out, or 
It could embrace its neighborhood and its community and this region as a source of strength for the university going forward. And we, I'm proud to say, opted for the latter. We, we actually went into strategic planning mode and two years later came out of that with a single page strategic plan that had four strategic pillars tied to the future of the university. Undergraduate education, interdisciplinary research, internationalization, and literally to build upon the resources of Southern California, especially those characteristics of the region that are central to urban issues, multiculturalism, arts, entertainment, communications, and business. USC, rather than retaliating from its community, embraced it at the highest, most strategic level of the president and the board. And the campus community adopted this strategic plan premised on the belief that this institution could build upon the resources and construct a new paradigm for urban communities. It was in our strategic plan, it was in our operating plan, and together it stated that we would pursue mutual goals with the ethnic and racial communities surrounding our campuses with the opportunity of building a model of excellence for Los Angeles. Five years after that strategic planning session, USC was actually called, um, named College of the Year by both Time Magazine and Princeton um, Review. And the reason it received that accolade, it was premised on this idea that you, the university had forged with its local schools, its community residents, police, business, and community-based organizations, a long-lasting partnership, one based on mutual goals. So this experience was 25 years ago and frankly was my first introduction to truly strategic leadership, the kind of leadership that shapes institutional strategy moving forward and changes communities along the way. I learned a lot of lessons during that period about how boards need to be more representative and diverse, how they need to work collaboratively with senior leaders to create prosperity and opportunity, but how you can actually create a paradigm that doesn't just lift the institution, but lifts its people, its neighborhood, its community, and the region at the same time. What I learned from that experience 25 years ago is that strategic leadership requires conviction. And it's not just daring to believe in the right thing, but when you pair conviction with courage, which is the ability to act in the right way, to take bold and assertive steps forward, that is what really will move institutions to the next level. Conviction with courage and the ability to take bold and assertive steps. And so now, 25 years later, when you look around that region, you've got all kinds of just, you know, extraordinary partnerships underway. From the Magnolia Place community initiatives to families and schools to the neighborhood academic initiative, the resiliency of that community has been enhanced by the strategic leadership of that individual and their ability to bring the governance along with them. As you heard, my grandfather was a man of great courage and also great conviction. He came to the United States from Mexico around the turn of the last century. He founded La Opinion in 1926. And in September of this year, we will celebrate our 90th anniversary. I joined that institution some 30 years ago and just recently stepped down as its CEO. I have always believed, thanks to my grandfather, that business can be a force for positive social good. We were built upon the belief and founded on the belief that large segments of our population not only need to be informed, but they need to be able to depend on institutions that can defend and advocate on their behalf. A community needs institutional allies. And for us, it was completely consistent 
and with our purpose to act in this way. This sense of responsibility back to our community is ingrained in our DNA and harkens back to the founding of the paper. When I became CEO responsible for leading the company, I encouraged my employees to remember what business we were in. We were not about printing newspapers or distributing newspapers every day. At the core of who we are, our essence is to educate and empower a community. Our mission is to be of service to a community, a community that is finding its voice and building towards its dream, to capture and tell those stories every day of immigrant students getting into college, of families starting businesses or buying homes for the first time, as well as the stories of inequity and hardship the fear of deportation, the lack of trained ELL teachers, the overcrowding, the lack of basic services. Those are the stories that we are determined to tell. And over time, over these 90 years, we have developed a unique and personal relationship to our community. We advocate on their behalf. We empower through information. We provide access to resources to education, to healthcare, to financial literacy. Now, I don't want to be Pollyannish about my business. We are in an industry that has completely been disrupted by changes in consumer habits and technology. Coming out of the Great Recession, more than 300 daily newspapers closed down. Navigating through that downturn into the new normal was not without pain. And to tell you, at times, we questioned our own survivability. But I always believe that if we stayed close to our community, if we listened and understood their needs and reflected it in how we behaved, then we could withstand those external pressures. Because if you keep your customer at the center of what you do every day, if you listen, if you make sure that your organization is customer-centric and understand their needs and issues and their concerns, they will help you evolve your organization along the way. Listening is absolutely critical to staying relevant. So we deploy reporters, we gather stories, we talk with mom and dads, we listen. And this, in today's age, requires an entirely new mindset about what listening to customers means in the 21st century. It actually means being a partner. It could be our customer, it could be your client, your community, your constituency. But you are being called upon to act as a partner today. An organization that thinks and operates with the customer at its core will be able to shape its future because it will be hand in hand with the customers that you serve. Society demands it from us. And a philanthropy is not immune to these external pressures and the need to adapt in this ever-changing, highly disruptive environment. So as you think systemically about being of service and providing tools for social change, I ask you, who are you listening to? Do you have systems in place to capture feedback, not just from experts or consultants? Are you in the field, meeting directly with clients? Do you encourage your staff to volunteer to, at nonprofits, to attend community meetings, to live among grantees? I know it might not be practical, and many ways, depending on the scope and the scale and the geography of your organizations, you may never be able to operationalize it. But I think it's absolutely essential that in this evolving landscape, strategic leadership requires being customer-centric, and that means listening. We at the Weingart Foundation, I should say Fred Ali and the Weingart Foundation, we shifted, and you know Fred, we shifted our grant making so much more intentionally because we were listening. And you won't be surprised that we actually, based on what we heard from our community and our customers, in this case, our nonprofit community, completely realigned our grant-making strategy. 
We redeployed our dollars, the majority of our dollars, based on what we heard from our non the nonprofit sector to core operating support. Unrestricted, multi-year grants invested in nonprofit capacity building and effectiveness. And we do this because we believe that this is the way that this foundation can build a stronger Southern California. Just like this institution or my newspaper was committed to building a strong Southern California. The only way you do it effectively is by having courage, by having conviction, and by listening to customers. So what do you do in this fast-paced, always changing environment? Old formulas are not predictive anymore. New knowledge is leading to radically new ways of viewing the world. Mobile technology has made the world smaller and people have greater access to information and knowledge. Constituents have voices that used to not have voices. We also are seeing the great trends of migration and urbanization and globalization, economic and demographic transformations, the browning of America. These transformations require every sector to assess, to reassess, to adjust, and to adapt. So while it creates some challenge, because adapting to change is not easy, it opens the door to great opportunity. Philanthropy has the ability to take the long view, to identify systems, and then the leverage points at which those systems can be influenced. Philanthropy can seed innovation. It can drive and encourage innovation in the system. If it's not held back by fear of failure or the reluctance to experiment. We all want to see proven solutions at scale, at scale and that are sustainable. But with the world changing as quickly as ours is, we need to adapt models and stay vigilant and identify new approaches. It's in this environment of questioning, challenging, and testing that innovative solutions are born. I encourage you to think as innovatively as you can, to drive innovation through your organizations, to learn to adapt and to be flexible. We are evaluating today multiple pathways for social change, and every one of those strategies has to not be rigid or inflexible, but has to, be, has to allow itself to adapt and to harness the forces of the kind of change that we are experiencing today. So this rapidity of change externally also means that there are more numerous and diverse sets of actors. I talked about the power moving into the hands of consumers. There is a new window open for collaboration today that I had never seen exist before. It used to be the old paradigm of government, civil society, business, each acted primarily in their own sphere, limited interaction, each independent, not necessarily trying to influence each other. And each role was basically independently defined. But this new paradigm, the change, the rapidity, the need to adapt, also requires collaboration. And it requires a greater degree of activity, this framework of collaboration, the blurring of traditional roles, and today we're seeing this evidence of new hybrid organizations that are starting to emerge. It's precisely what you've been talking about here all day. No one entity, not USC, not a foundation, not a business, has the capacity to move the dial alone. We need philanthropy and government and the private sector and the financial markets and other institutions and nonprofits to all come together collaboratively to seek solutions. It is precisely this interplay of complex systems that strategies must be co-created with other players in the system. If we're flexible and free enough 
and can respond to the un sometimes unpredictable nature of the environment, we should be able to move this forward. What Rockefeller is doing, what the California Endowment is doing with the ACA, what Kresge is doing in Detroit, what Carnegie is doing with democracy, what USC did at the neighborhood level. There is an ever-increasing demonstration by philanthropy and other institutional actors to build alliances and deepen partnerships to accelerate progress. Looking ahead, what we see are ecosystems. Ecosystems of actors and organizations and industries with shared leadership and shared influence and a growing importance of partnerships and networks. And there's lots of examples in my own business even where competitors came together to advance a common need in our community. And just recently, where the titans of Spanish language media, Univision, Telemundo, my own company, Infermedia, all came together to work around really important social issues like citizenship and immigrant integration and healthcare. We spent hours together in a room brainstorming, thinking about ideas for outreach and partnership and the tools and the phases that we collaboratively could execute against to move the needle, to build a deeper sense of mutuality and a commitment to the outcome together. So the rules of engagement have changed, and while it's messy, the reality is that it is required. If we are to scale and to reach the kind of change that all of us in this room aspire to, we need to learn and adapt and collaborate in order to achieve greater impact. So let me close with what I think might be the single most important contributor to success in this new world. It's not enough for your organization to simply have a clear direction. People have to be able to throw themselves entirely into the game to be successful with full engagement of heart and mind. Purpose creates the ability for people to care about something much bigger than their personal concerns and fully apply their talents to meaningful endeavors. Purpose gives people a far more expansive space to create and to grow, where creative, purpose-based thinking replaces crisis-based or firefighting thinking. An organization of people who have connected themselves to something bigger will thrive, not simply survive. It will move faster, it will act more nimbly, it will adjust strategies and tactics to succeed. Finding purpose for an organization has profound effects, not just on customers, not just on employees or the bottom line. Purpose is what will differentiate us and our ability to be successful. Strategic leaders in the 21st century have to have a way of building community, of bringing people together to solve problems. It shouldn't matter what our title is. If we're clear about purpose and have a desire to continue to learn, we are the carriers of culture. We need to breed the new leaders who respect people and allow for communities to form that are where they can form where we are no longer at the head. Strategic leadership means listening. It means knowing how to build communities, how to encourage a culture of co-creation driven by conscious leaders who create shared purpose. So how we respond and take all of this into account under these changing circumstances in this need to maintain relevancy in the 21st century. Strategy has to be a combination of intent and adaptation and recognizing that we are at an inflection point. We could do what some institutions have chosen to do and move with conviction and with courage in the right direction. We have a joint role 
to make this world better, to be a force for social change. Philanthropy should be able to attract the very best people, to admit mistakes, to have bold theories of change, to set new models for how government dollars are, are spent. But whether you are founded over 100 years ago, like the Rockefeller Foundation, or 90 years ago, like La Opinion, our mission has not changed. It is the pursuit of this timeless mission that has taken many forms, has adapted to the changing times, and is responsive to the historic opportunities for achieving enduring success. This mission invites us to challenge ourselves. Lead with conviction and courage. Be customer-centric. Stay curious. Look for collaborations and partnership as a model at this new intersection. It is you, decision makers, stakeholders, media, thought leaders, that working together to achieve impact can affect the kind of change that we all seek to improve the lives of poor and vulnerable. Interventions and innovation at the intersection depends on strategic leadership. Thank you very much.